All right, hey everybody, Dr. Hagmar here, and today we're talking about the ileocecal valve. We're talking about what it does, why it's important, symptoms that occur when the IC valve stay, stays in a stuck open position, why it gets stuck open, um, how it relates to IBS and SIBO and many other GI disorders. And finally, I want to talk to you about three scenarios that you should be aware of that correlate with IC valve dysfunction. All right, so let's start unpacking some of these important concepts. And of course, uh, before I forget to mention, if after watching today's video, if you think you have a problem with your IC valve, I did shoot a video not that long ago um, and that I would recommend you go back and it explains the step-by-step -step process on how to massage the ileocecal valve, also called the IC release technique, how you do it, how long you should do it. Um, again, it's only a few minutes long and uh, again, it'll give you some really good tips on, on how to locate that IC valve, right? So you can go back and again, watch that at a later time. All right. So what is this ileocecal valve? Why is it important? Well, if you look at this picture below, the ileocecal valve separates the small intestines, which is the orange area, from the large intestines, which is, again, this darker red area. It's located in the lower right quadrant of your belly. Uh, and if you were to draw a vertical line uh, through your belly and a horizontal line through your belly, you'd end up with four quadrants, right? Now, the lower right quadrant, that's the location of where you can find the IC valve. Again, it's also the quadrant where you can find the appendix. So many people uh, will have pain in this region and of course, without a doubt, they will think it's the appendix. And so they, what you'll often find is if you go to the emergency room, and I've had this happen to many patients, is that if you can jump up and down without pain, it's probably not your appendix, all right? So again, it's probably your IC valve if you've been having a lot of these other symptoms that we're talking about. But of course, here's my disclaimer. Uh, is that this video, of course, is for informational purposes only, and it's not for diagnosis. So if you have signs of things like fever and nausea and vomiting and jumping causes pain, you, of course, should go see your doctor and rule out an appendix. Of course, whether or not a CT or an ultrasound is required at that point can be determined by the doctor that you're, you're seeing. All right, so what does this ileocecal valve do? Well, the normal function of the ileocecal valve is to function like a trap door between the small and the large intestines. It opens and closes at certain times, um, and for the most part, it's closed, right? It only opens when food is ready to pass from the small intestines down into the large intestines for further digestion, right? Now, when food pushes up against this valve, the small intestines distend and a reflex is created. It briefly opens up and the contents of the small intestines exit into the large intestines. After food has moved through it, then that valve closes quickly to prevent the contents of the large intestines from leaking back up into the small intestines. That's what should happen, right? However, with SIBO and many other kinds of gastrointestinal problems, that ileocecal valve becomes one of the many risk factors, like I just mentioned, right? A valve stuck in the closed position can cause tightness in the abdomen. It can cause cramping in the abdomen. And ultimately, it can also cause constipation and reabsorption of toxins leading to toxicity. Now, if it stays open too long or it spasms and gets stuck in the open position, it can be a frequent cause of diarrhea or a frequent cause of malabsorption of vitamins and leading to things like mineral deficiencies and electrolyte loss and dehydration due to, again, that diarrhea, right? Now, that makes, should just make sense. If, if food and nutrients go through your intestines too quickly, your body doesn't have the time to reabsorb them in the parts of the intestine that are designed to absorb those nutrients and electrolytes. Now, most of the bile that, again, helps break down fats, this is also reabsorbed in the end or the distal part of the small intestine. So if you have too much bile uh, entering into the large intestines, we call this bile acid malabsorption. And this is, again, this is a very common problem for people with diarrhea, right? Um, we can often detect uh, things like high levels of fecal fat or proteins in the stool on a special test called a functional stool test. So again, people with SIBO, the problem is the IC valve is getting stuck in the open position. Now, in a study done in digestive diseases and science, what researchers wanted to find out was that if the pressure, high or low, in the small intestines was related to this intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and if it could be correlated with a positive lactulose breath test. And as you already know, SIBO is diagnosed with a special test called a hydrogen methane breath test. But in this particular study, they used a wireless motility capsule, also known as a WMC. And this is a pill that a patient swallows, 
and it records the pressure and the pH of the region uh, of the small and the large, where the small and large intestines meet. And what they found was that patients with lower pressure and an open valve had positive lactulose breath test readings, but they also had symptoms of fullness during meals, gas, and bloating, right? They also noticed that patients with higher pressure had negative lactulose breath tests, and those patients denied having any gastrointestinal symptoms and complaints, right? So the results of these studies show us that an open ileocecal valve is highly related to SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The researchers concluded that malfunction of the ileocecal valve is a prominent player in intestinal disorders and should be considered in patients struggling with gastrointestinal complaints. So without going into and, and um, undergoing the kinds of research testing, how do you know if you have a problem with your ileocecal valve? I mean, do you have to have this wireless motility capsule test done? And the answer is no. So let me give you three scenarios that I think are good indicators that indicate you have a problem with the ileocecal valve. Number one is, do you feel pressure underneath your ribs? Do you have pain in the right portion of your, of your belly button angled at about 45 degrees, just where we just described that ileocecal valve? Number two, do you have mid back pain or upper back pain uh, or pain that wraps around uh, to your back? Right? Do you have pain that radiates to the right shoulder? And while again, this could be a gallbladder problem, it also could be an ileocecal valve problem. Now, if you answered yes to any of these, after watching today's video, I recommend you go watch a video that I did titled, How to Release the Ileocecal Valve Through a Self-Massage Technique um, that will help release that IC valve tension, right? Again, especially if you have those three symptoms, it'd be a good idea to see if that changes some of those symptoms. Now, if you're interested in watching this video, I'll leave a link in the description. You can go back, you can watch how to perform the IC valve release. So again, if you suspect you have a problem with the ileocecal valve, I suggest you start with this massaging technique. Uh, be sure to rule out problems such as an appendix, or if you're a woman, problems with your ovary. Sometimes uh, ovarian cysts can create similar symptoms. Um, the last thing I want to share with you today is some of the causes and the reasons why the IC valve may have developed a problem. Number one, the ileocecal valve may be disrupted through a number of mechanisms, okay? And they're kind of all somewhat related. Remember that the ileocecal valve is a muscular sphincter, and these muscles receive signals from surrounding nerves. That's the key. Some of these things that I think about when I suspect an IC valve dysfunction will also be the things that I think about when it comes to motility issues, right? These are many things to consider here, and certain kinds of functional tests, without a doubt, can flush out what some of these problems are, right? So number one is neurological insult. Sometimes we have what's called uh, the migrating motor complex, um, and the cleansing waves or the pacemaker cells, many times um, these can be a problem, uh, but these are again related to a neurological insult. These are the cells again that, that control the intestinal contractions, right? The cleansing waves. Number two is post infectious IBS, right? Any kind of antibody response or autoimmune reaction to vinculin, uh, which again is a protein that functions in the migrating motor complex. Again, this is post-infectious IBS, and there's testing that can be done to identify that. Number three is a bout of food poisoning, all right? This could come from E. coli, could come from salmonella, could come from shigella, could from campylobacter, could have been a past infection that you had. Again, all of these bacteria produce a toxin called cytotoxin, uh, cytolethal distendin toxin B. And again, there was a video that uh, I will leave a link for that you can watch if you've ever had a bout of food poisoning. And then shortly thereafter, um, you developed IBS and you were never right. Number four is pH of the ileum and colon, right? The pH of the, of the ileum will affect motility, and we can identify this through stool testing. Um, number five, levels of short-chain fatty acids, right? Uh, short-chain fatty acids, when we have low levels of these short-chain fatty acids, this can also affect motility. This is why very often when I run tests on patients and I do a functional stool test and I see low levels of short chain fatty acids, it's one of the things that becomes um, something that I often prescribe to a patient from a dietary standpoint. I prescribe those short chain fatty acids because again, they have an impact on pH. They impact the, um, um, the functionality of the gut and motility. So again, something very important. Number six is bloating. Um, the very nature of bloating itself can cause the valve to stay open or even go into spasm. Um, the next thing I think about is the emptying and filling of the gallbladder, right? There's some research that showed that this is also tied in 
to the migrating motor complex. Um, we know stress, stress, uh, that fight or flight response involving the vagus nerve. We know that that stress puts our body in this sympathetic dominant state as opposed to a parasympathetic state. And remember, parasympathetics are activated through digestion. And so if we're in a sympathetic state, not in the parasympathetic state, our whole digestion is going to be shut down, right? So again, very, very important. So again, um, from a dietary standpoint, don't eat when you're stressed out, right? That only makes sense. Um, you know, blood moves away from those organs of digestion. And instead, uh, there's less nutrients and oxygen and things like that going to uh, the GI system, which again, could be part of the reason uh, for um, spasms and cramping. Medications, alcohol, pain medications, these again are all things that can interfere with uh, the functioning of that ileocecal valve. All right, so that's gonna wrap up today's video. I know we talked about a lot of things, but again, dealing with SIBO, it's much more than just this overgrowth um, and taking some sort of, of antibacterial or, or antimicrobial to correct the underlying problem. I kind of tend to look at SIBO as really just the tip of the iceberg and looking at all the other factors around that are the culprits behind why this overgrowth developed in the first place. Again, we want to think root cause medicine here, not just killing um, antibiotics, uh, killing the bacteria with the antibiotics. Okay, so that's going to wrap up today's video. Hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, take care.